Hello, ladies. So it is my turn um, to speak at the well. Thank you for the one person that was excited. <laughs> the one person who I think I'm pretty sure I know who it was. Um, but so I'm very excited to be here tonight. For those of you who do not know me, um, my name is Allison Barton. So I am the pastor's wife here at the Creek. Uh, we've been married for 17 years as of February 23rd. So over that 17 years, um, we've had a lot of ups and downs, and you'll see why I'm talking about this in just a second. So our marriage now is much different than when we first started. Um, our first year, I would describe as hell. Um, so we were engaged after six months and then stayed engaged for two years, and then we got married, and there's... In a marriage, and when you first start out, there's a lot of immaturity. There's a lot of my way or no way, and I'm going to pack my bag, and we'll see where this takes me. Got out on the road, decided I was going to walk one day. I'm like, let me out, and I'll show you. Um, so there's different things that happen, and it was very much a battle uh, between the two of us for, for quite some time of who's going to win, who's going to be right, who's going to take charge. We both have very, very strong personalities, I would say. Um, there were occasionally some chest bumps, if you can <laughs> believe that, if you know your pastor now and you know me, there was occasionally some, what, like, bring it, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you. Um, so there were there's those moments in those first years, um, and I've told stories before that he was a youth pastor at that time, and so there was a lot of stress uh, on that marriage. We lived right in front of the church, youth group would come over, we had just been fighting horribly, and then they would walk in and faces have to change, and now game is on. And, and so the relationship was very, very difficult in the start. So over the last several years, we've had a lot of changes um, in our relationship, in our home. Uh, one of the things that we've done, we've moved several times. Uh, we moved from Middlesbrough to Atlanta, back to London, to a different house in London. We call it the outskirts of Manchester. So, so we, we have made lots of strategic changes um, throughout this time. One of the big changes, which I like to call a stressful blur in my life, uh, we prayed about it, Trevor and I prayed about it, about me going back to medical school. Medical school was the original plan until I met him. Plans derailed. Uh, then we came back around to it and we, we prayed about that. Is this what we want to do? During medical school, so four years, we had Shepherd. Um, so I strategically planned. Once again, you know, you're trying to get everything strategically planned. When's the best time? Okay, I'm going to have him during my third year. So there's some pressure involved with that. Uh, so we had Shepherd then. So I am the mom of two boys, Shepherd and Grayson. Grayson I had during residency. So I did a residency in OBGYN in Lexington, Kentucky. God had his hand very much through everything that we did at that point. He opened doors. He, you know, we didn't think about it. When I applied to medical school, what's going to happen after these four years? You know, I'm commuting from Harrogate back to London to Harrogate to London. What am I going to do when it's time to apply to residency? It was just assumed this is all going to work out. And so we prayed very, very hard about where I'm going to be. Because at this point, he's now, we've moved back from um, Georgia. We're back in London. I've been commuting to medical school. So now he has this church, and the church is growing the church is doing so well, and we love the people, and we love the area, and God was just doing an amazing work. And we started with 40, and I think now we're around 2,000. And so he's busy and running, and I'm busy and running, and then it's time to apply for residency. And most people apply to many, many places, um, and whichever place likes you the most, they rank you, and that's how you do it. So what I did is something um, called suiciding. Suicide means you list one place, and if you don't get that place, guess what? You go nowhere. You have no job, you've spent a fortune on medical school, and you have no plan. And so that's what we did, because I thought, well, he can't have a church in London, and me be in residency in Boston or Florida or wherever. So I applied in Lexington and Lexington only and said, you know, God, let's make this work. So during that time, I am told that we had lots of dinner parties and we had people over. 
I had one of my good friends and her husband, and they would come over and watch a series with us every week. Do you know that I do not recall the majority of that? I do not recall. I recall being very busy and expecting people to be at my house when I got home, but I can't tell you that I intentionally remember speaking to them, hanging out with them. Oh, yay. It was more like get up at 4, drive to Lexington, do your job, get home by 7, eat with these people, go to bed, hopefully see your new son, hopefully see your other new son. Um, so, so it was just very chaotic. And life can get so chaotic sometimes that you, you forget to be um, relational with people. And so <laughs> guess what Gabby asked me to talk about? Uh, relationships. And I thought, well, I'm fantastic at them. I don't even remember people coming to my house to eat with me. I don't remember watching a whole series over the span of years with people. I was kind of in my own little world trying to balance everything and make everything work. And people kind of got shoved to the wayside. So the other thing is that after all of that, I'm currently an OBGYN. Uh, so I'm a full-time OBGYN, and I work at London Women's Care. So delivering babies, doing surgeries, get up in the morning, get the kids ready, normally screaming at them, get in the car, what do you understand? Get on your shoes, get on your shoes. Do you understand what shoes are? Do, do you understand English at this point? Do you understand what is coming out of my mouth? I, and then, you know, I'm trying to get them out the door, I'm getting ready, I'm trying to go do surgery, then I gotta be at the office by 8.30. So it's this rapid, rapid pace. And if you know me, you know I'm not at the office by 8.30. So uh, it's a rapid, chaotic lifestyle. And Trevor's busy. And now the church has three campuses. And he's getting people involved and trying to strategically place people. And we've got a wonderful staff uh, that supports decisions and that are available and capable people. Very, very capable people. But organizing all of that and then plus me doing this... It can become so chaotic that you, you forget to slow down. You forget to take time. I have a person at work who I absolutely adore, and she often <laughs> offers, and I think sometimes seriously, to be my life manager because I kind of slide into work and it's like throwing everything around, jumping in to see a patient or two, and she's like, why don't I just quit and I'll come and organize you and help you get all of this stuff done. And I'm like, you know, it's not a bad idea. I would kind of appreciate it most mornings if somebody would, you know, organize and do some things. So, when our time is so chaotic, how are we supposed to focus on relationships? So when she said, hey, let's talk about relationships, let's talk about marriage, let's talk about friendship, I thought, I am the worst <laughs> person at this. I'm not good at calling people. I don't text people. I may see your message. I may respond to it a week later. You never know. I'm not good at the whole thing. So I thought of some things that have occurred recently. Okay. So this one was two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, I look at my colleague who's one of my best friends at London Women's Care, and we're both exceptionally busy in our practice. We're both full time. She gets very Stress. She's trying to get to everybody and see everybody, and, and our jobs can be very stressful, and she's running up and down the hallway. But she's so friendly. She's so friendly that people stop and talk to her all day long. So at lunch the other day, I said, you know what your problem is? I said, you smile too much. I said, stop looking at people. If you don't look at them, don't make eye contact with them. They're not going to come up and talk to you about, oh, I'm thinking about getting my hair cut. Look at these shoes. My kid, he likes to eat green beans. And you're just like, why? Can you see that she's running up and down the hallway? I'm like, no one does that to me. No one stops because you know why? <laughs> I'm not smiling at them. I'm not stopping. If they're talking to me, I'm looking at the computer because I have a task and I want to get it done. I said, so you need to quit being so friendly. It's never going to happen for her. That's, that's her personality. That's who she is. She's going to stop. She looks at them, listens to what they're going to say. And I know internally she's freaking out because she's got three people in a room. I'm like, why would you choose now to talk about your new haircut? Why? <laughs> Do you know that there's a lunch hour? Do you know that we get off work at some point? Like, if you want to tell her that then, tell her that then, but stop smiling. So I thought, that's great relationship advice from the pastor's wife. Don't smile at people. Don't make eye contact with them. Keep your head down and get your stuff done. Worry about them later. So that was thing number one. Thing number two. I'm going to get it. So thing number two, as you, I said, I'm an OBGYN. 
So my kids, for the longest time, thought that I worked on people's knees. <laughs> it's not very far, but that's what they think and that's what they would tell people that I do. Oh, my mom works on people's knees. <laughs> Okay, we'll let you think that for now. The older one is kind of catching on a little bit. He's like, aha. So if they don't come out via C-section, where are they? I'm like, ha it's a great question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they thought that I worked on people's knees. So I'm gonna use that in this next illustration. I'm gonna use the word knees instead of what I actually do, okay? <laughs> so there are days in clinic where you get super frustrated. Super frustrated, you're behind, people are getting angry, it's not like I want to be behind, but sometimes you do get behind. What you want to say, these people are like, I haven't been waiting so long, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, you know what? You didn't have cancer. Your baby's still alive. So let me shed a slow tear for you that you've been sitting in your chair with your healthy baby. So it really, you're just like, oh my goodness. Okay, so one day I was there. I'm running. I'm literally running, trying to see everybody. And this girl steps out of the room, into the hallway. And it was just one of those days, you're like, okay, arms out, I'm like, okay. So she says, I've been bleep, 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 waiting for bleep, 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 an hour. And I thought, today's the day. <laughs> today's the day, partner. So I put my computer down, she was gonna see me. And so I put my computer down and I busted in the door. I didn't knock, I busted in the door and I said, get out. Get out then, I said, I can see your knees today. I can see your knees tomorrow. I can see your knee in a week from now. I don't care, get out, get out the door. And I, I said, your choices are to walk or to get undressed on the table so that I can see your knee. And I slammed the door. And you know, moments later you rethink it and you're like, ah, not the best, not the best patient care model, but there's times when you're like, okay. So relationships, I'm not great at them. I'm like, here you go, this is it, this is your day. The other thing, sometimes I have people text me, text me, private message, people can get a hold of you all sorts of ways. So there's a younger girl, she's in our church. She'll, she'll probably watch this at some point. So she texts me the other day, and I'm gonna read you exactly what she texts me. So she says, quote, I'm writing to tell you that I want to be like you someday. So I'm so socially awkward that I just wrote, you are so funny. That was it. There was no inspirational, it was basically I said, ha, ha, ha. Like, I'm like, I don't know what to say to that because I am a tornado of chaos. So no, you do not want to be like me, but you're so funny. So that was it. That was all that I had to offer her. So, this is the thing, is that we're not always great at relationships, but we all can be, okay? So if you think about it, we have a very large circle of friends, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, text messages. We have a lot of friends and a big, large circle of people that we know. What we don't think about in our day-to-day -day is that we're seeing the best side of them, we're seeing the 18th picture in their roll of selfies that they take at work, which I still find exceptionally strange. But if you do that, fine, you know, good for you. Um, but you're seeing the best out of them. You're seeing the best picture of their family, the best picture that they took while they're at Taco Bell. Whatever it is, it's the best. It's filtered. Everything is totally different. And you know them, you know their name, you may know that they have kids, you may know that their kids are involved in sports, you know very superficial things about these people, but they're not truly your friends. When I come to church on Sunday, I may know, hey, that's the door greeter, and his name is Jim. Other than that, I don't know anything else about Jim. He is an acquaintance, but he's not technically a friend. So this is one of the things um, that I want to focus on. Why do we have so many acquaintances but only a few friends? One of the things is fear. We're afraid, and I'm going to give you a quote here. So if you like quotes, I would write this down because I absolutely love this one. So this is from Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said, we are afraid to care too much for fear that the other person does not care at all. So have you ever felt yourself in that position? You don't want to put yourself out there. You don't want to 
be overly involved with someone for fear that they are not gonna reciprocate that. It is a fear in that relationship that you do not want to reach out or be the one who's overly involved, and so you pull back. So there's a fear with getting too close to people. There's a fear that they're gonna see possibly the real you and not Instagram you, right? Um, the second one is betrayal. Um, sometimes you've had a past betrayal. And when you've had a past betrayal, you're like, I don't even need this anymore. I don't need one more stress. I don't need one more person. I don't need one more thing to add to my daily stress. And so I've caught myself there. It's like, okay, this happened before. I'm not going to reach out to this person. I'm not going to be involved. And if you think of Jesus, Jesus definitely was betrayed, right? If you think of Judas. And the big thing is that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. But it did not stop him from including him and teaching him and bringing him in and letting him see the innermost parts. Even though he knew, he still, we don't know that. And so it's up to us to take that risk, but people are going to betray you. So there is a quote that I found, um, which I also loved. And it said, uh, the truth is, is that everyone will hurt you. It's just a matter of figuring out which ones are worth suffering for. <laughs> It's from Bob Marley, so I'll write that down. Uh, <laughs> so I really like that one. I was like, I like this. It's Bob Marley. It's okay. Um, but, and that is true to some degree. People are going to hurt you. Everyone is fallible. Everyone can mess up. And so the thing is, is which ones are worth sticking in there for the long haul? Which ones are you going to attach yourself to and kind of continue with? Another thing is your stage of life can get in your way of being able to form friendships. Maybe you're running with your kids. Maybe you've got involved in soccer, volleyball, tennis, basketball, football. You're running to a million different championships and games and practices, all the practices. And, and you're running so much that you don't even have time to think about, hey, how is Suzanne doing? Hey, I know that this happened to her the other day. Maybe I should call and check on her. Because you, you're, you're so busy in the stage of life that you're in. And not that that's a bad thing, but sometimes it inhibits our friendship. The other thing is overextended. You're overextended. Maybe you're overextended at work. You've agreed to be on too many committees. You've agreed to do too many whatever the case may be for you. And you've overextended yourself to the point that you have no time for other people. You have no time to form anything but acquaintances. And what you need is friendships. Do you, all, do you understand how many times Trevor Barton says, you need more friends? <laughs> to which I just wanted to choke him. I'm like, if I have anything else, I can't add one more thing to my day. I can't get it in. Um, the other thing is that you could just be unfriendly. And sometimes that's me. Sometimes you're just downright unfriendly. I'm sure that the girl that I said, get out, she thinks I'm pretty unfriendly. She did, however, let me examine her knee, just so we're all clear. <laughs> um, but the Bible says that we have to show ourselves friendly. So if you want friends, if you want to extend this relationship, you actually have to be friendly. Like my coworker, you may have to smile at people, you may have to look at them occasionally, but you have to show yourself friendly. This is a big one for me, is isolation. So, and by isolation, you think, I don't need them. I've got plenty, I've got plenty of people, I've got plenty of things to do, I don't need them. And, and you tend to kind of withdraw and, and you don't reach out to anyone. So a thing came up the other day where I had a mammogram, because I'm grade age 40. So I had a mammogram and they found two nodules. And for a second, I thought to myself, I'm not gonna tell anybody. Not even going to tell Trevor, because we all know how he is about medical things. So I thought, no, it's not happening. <laughs> I was like, not happening. So my lead off, which was fantastic, was, hey, did you um, increase our life insurance the other day, like you said you were going to? And he's like, and Tim went up, why? What are, you, what are you talking about? So the long story short is, my initial thing was pull back. And that's what a lot of us do. We pull back. And I ended up telling five people, everything's fine, by the way. But I ended up telling five people that I strategically called and said, hey, this is what's going on. I'm going to have to go for additional testing. But that was only at the urge of Trevor. Because he said, you have to have a circle. You have to have a circle of people around you. So sometimes he is right. Uh, so one of the things I want you to write down. So this is, if you are taking notes, I want you to write this down. 
Be friendly to all, but friend to a few. Okay? Be friendly to all, but friend to a few. So if you think about Jesus, Jesus had thousands of followers, right? He had people that followed him everywhere, asking him questions. Um, they basically kind of traveled with them in a little pack, right? Can you imagine that? That would just be horrible. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so he had the thousands, but then he narrowed it down, had his group of 12, narrowed it even further down, and had his group of three. So Peter, James, and John. So the inner circle. And every time I say that, I think of like, meet the parents, right? Get in the, you're in the circle of trust, Greg. So you've got people that are in your circle of trust. You've got people on the outside. That's the way I'm going to think about that. So if you think about it as far as like people at your house. This is how you're gonna delineate who the true friends are. Acquaintances can come anywhere. They can go, basically, they can go to your kitchen. They can go to your living room. Those areas are normally pretty clean, right? <laughs> your little closer circle, right? They can go, they can come in even if it's a little messy. Fine, come on in, that's fine. Your inner circle, they're going to your laundry room. <laughs> they're going to your closet. You're like, I don't care. You're gonna love me anyway, it's fine. Um, so you know if you've been to my closet that you're in the inner, you're in the inner circle. So just write that down. So, so the point being, that, that's kind of the way that you think about that. You definitely have your acquaintances. I'm going to meet you at the door. Maybe you can see the kitchen. Fine. You bring it a little bit in, a little bit farther in. I thought of this the other day. I don't know if anybody else gets stuck in shirts. I get stuck all the time. So... I mean, I'm not like, I, whatever, I can fit in things, but my arms are like sausages. And I, you can't, you can't get, I can't get out of things. Like I've had to wake Trevor up to actually help me, like I can't get out of them. So I can get them over my head and then it's just like this sausage forms right here on that lovely arm fat. And it's like, it's not budging. It's not, there's nothing you can do. So you're stuck like this, right? So I'm in the dressing room at Posh the other day and the, person was waiting on me, and she, I've known her for a long, long time since she was little, and she, she can hear that I'm stuck, because I'm totally stuck in this dress of hers, and if you've had kids, you know that this is not, this is not a good posture from this side angle, um, and so I'm stuck, I'm completely stuck, and she says, do you want me to come in there and help you? Heck no. <laughs> Heck no. And I said to her, I will rip this dress in half before you open the store to come in. So, so that, the people that I would have let in, that's your inner circle. Those are the people. You, not in the inner circle. I'm not coming in to see this bent over like this. So, <laughs> second thing that I want you to write down. So not everyone can or should be your friend. Not everyone can or should be your friend. You can't and should not be everyone's friend. So I'm going to actually read some verses off here to you. So Proverbs 13:20. So if you are taking notes, write that down. Proverbs 13:20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. 1 Corinthians 15:33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So you can't and should not be everyone's friend. So I think of this um, very much when you are younger and you are forming these new relationships, you're going off to college, you're, you're making all these new friends. Not everyone should be your friend. Not everyone should come within that close circle. You want people to make you better, to build you up, not to bring you down, not to cause harm, not to corrupt you. Maybe you started off good, but the longer that you're around this person, the more that you start to become like them. So that is not a good friend. That is not a good relationship. You want someone who is making you become more like Jesus, not less. So what is a friend? So in Webster, someone who you have a strong liking for and trust in, okay? Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. So you want people to make you better. So I get asked a lot. Trevor goes on retreats. He goes to conferences. Um, we added it up the other day, and he's been gone several weeks since just, we'll say, the end of December till now. So let me just tell you, that really sucks for me. Um, and God bless every single mom out here. I honestly, honestly have zero idea how you do all that you do and stay sane. So, but this is the thing. 
People are like, are you not frustrated? Oh, he's gone again. These are people, you know, at work. Oh, he's gone again. So this is the thing, is that those conferences, those retreats, those times when he gets to pull away, that is making him better. And that's the way you have to think about it. Yeah, this week is gonna be horrible. I'm gonna to have to get the kids ready, I'm gonna to have to go operate, I gotta figure out this, I gotta get her clothes, I gotta get them dressed, I gotta make sure they have my shoes, I gotta make sure my little one wears underwear because he's not a fan of it. Um, so you, you've gotta get all of these things, but I, sometimes I have to stop because I can snowball so out of control and uh, he's gone again, look what all I'm doing. I've gotta do this and I gotta, but you have to stop that pattern and you have to switch your mind off and say, hey, but this is a week that he's gonna grow. He's gonna get to know people. He's gonna make acquaintances. He's going to have someone invest in him. Possibly he's gonna invest in someone else. This is what friendship is. It is iron sharpening iron. It should make you better, not worse. <clears throat> We also talked about, as far as friends goes, um, I don't know if everybody in here watched it, the funeral of George H.W. Bush. And if you heard anything about it, his chief of staff, uh, James Baker, basically rubbed his feet, kind of like washing his feet, if you want to think of it, in the hospital in his last days. So Trevor, being Trevor, I'm just thinking, ah, oh, that's nice, that's, that's me, Oof, that's nice, done. And so he's thinking about it, and he truly comes to like a crisis of, do I have any friends that are close enough to me to do the same? Is anybody gonna be there for me in the end that would do the same for me? So me, being my personality, I look at him, I was like, yeah, this one, this one, and this one. There's your three. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was quick, I was like, yeah, I know who's gonna watch your feet, I know it's gonna be these three. And, but for him, he was like, I don't know that I have made any tight enough relationships where that is gonna happen for me. And then I thought, you're wrong, but you don't see it, but that's okay. Um, I'm not thinking that, I'm like, that was nice of him. Way to go, way to go, James Baker. Um, but that's what you want. You want to develop friendships. So friends, something to write down. Friends accept the real you. They walk in when others walk out. So Trevor knows me better than anyone. So if you know me, I don't cry. I don't, I'm not a big crier, I'm not a big whatever. So this week he decides I don't ski as well. So this week he decides he's gonna take our family on a ski trip because he has fashioned in his mind that we are gonna be a family that skis together. <laughs> he has pictured it 20 years from now and I'm like, we're gonna be like in our 60s and our 70s. Picture want me to ski, okay, I got it, I got it. So I learned to ski. I went to ski school on Monday. <laughs> So if you know anything about skiing, it kind of goes green, blue, sometimes there's double blues, there's blacks. So I'm on the greens, right? I'm just learning, I'm just like making sure I can turn. I'm going as slow as I possibly can because I'm thinking <laughs> I gotta make money, I gotta you know, work, I can't like break my leg here having fun. And so on Wednesday, so Monday I'm in ski school, Tuesday I do some greens. Wednesday he said, I think you're ready for a blue. Let's take you up there. I've checked it out. I've, I've skied it myself. I think you're going to do just fine. And I said, well, that's great, um, but I have a little problem here. I'm not sure that I can do this. Oh, yeah, 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 you can. So we ride up the lift. As we ride up the lift, I can feel my heart. Like, I'm freaking out internally. And we get further and further up the mountain. I thought, oh, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is where the avalanches happen. This is exactly <laughs> where the avalanches happen. So we get up there, and he said, this is a bigger hill than you've ever went down before. Okay. Oh, well, so I'm glad that you've told me now that I just got off the chairlift, that this is gonna be the biggest thing that I've went down, that's, that's good. So I literally, I'm like this. Like, I'm trying to like go as slow as I can down this hill so that I don't kill myself. Then he says, okay, here's the track. I, I kid you not, it's like this wide, okay? It's, it's not wide at all, and there's nothing on this side. I am, as you can imagine, this is smiling and so peaceful. No, I am pitching a fit. I am losing my mind up there. I was like, what are you thinking? This is a horrible plan. So then we go. And I'm barely moving. People are whizzing past me and I'm like, barely like turning my skis because I am like, there's nothing over here. I would rather hit a tree than nothing. There's like nothing. So then he takes me down here. He goes, I think you can do this. Let's go down this hill. So I go down the hill and I bust. I mean, I fall, I'm hitting my head, I'm banging all around. He goes, not bad, <laughs> not bad, not bad. He said, that was, that was pretty good. And I, at this point, I'm sucking air. I'm totally just sucking air in and out. Like I cannot, I'm, I, 
I have totally lost my mind. And I looked at him and I said, I will not go down this mountain. <laughs> How am I getting down? <laughs> but in my mind, at the minute, I was like, I will not. I'm not moving any further. He said, you got to do something. He said, I can't call the ski patrol. You're not injured. I said, I am. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I will not move. I will take them off and I will walk down. And so, but this is the thing. He is my true friend. So he's walking in. He's standing right beside me as I am literally doubled over. I am like sucking that ski mask in and out of my mouth. And he said, I am right here with you. He said, I am not leaving you. I'm not going to let you fall. He said, I am right by your side. He said, there is nothing that's going to happen. Like, he's literally, <laughs> he's literally talking to me like I'm a child, but I enjoyed it. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay, I can, okay, I will, I will ski down now. I think I can do it. But they are the people that know the real you. They know your craziness, and they don't care, and they're going to stick with you. Um, friends are low maintenance. So if... <laughs> Carol needs a text every day. I'm just throwing out a name. I'm not naming anybody specific. Carol. Uh, if Carol needs a text every day, Carol, you got to move to an outer circle. Mm -mm. It's not happening. You can't be in the inner circle, Carol, if you're expecting me to call or text or anything. Uh-uh. Bump it out. Move it on out, Carol. So they're low maintenance. You can call them when you can call them, and they're going to be there. I have a friend. Called her, I think, yesterday. She's here from Knoxville. That's it. I don't call her every day. Known her since kindergarten. She doesn't expect me to call her every day. It's not going to happen. But she's my inner circle, and she showed up today. And that's what we're talking about. It's people who come in, and they stay there. Next, friends are truthful. They tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? So <laughs> on a lighter note, it's like when you look at your actual friend, and you're like, when are you going to wash that hair? You know, those are the people that you want in your inner circle because they're the truthful ones. They're like, hey, on a heavier side, it's the person who, when you call and you're saying, hey, me and so-and-so, we're not getting along. We're having a really rough time. And you're like, okay, so let's stop. Let's remember all the reasons that you fell in love with them to start with. Let's remember all the things that you've done together. Let's, let's stop this track because it's so easy to get on that track when you're in the low moment and think, man, why am I with this person? Why am I staying with them? Why am I going through this? Life would be so much easier, right? Without that stress, without that problem. And so you have to be, have those people in your life that can be like, hey, 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 hold up. You're wrong. You're wrong and you need to realize it. Or the people that look at me and like, you know what? You're stressed. You're losing it a little bit. You got to reel it back in. Those are the people that you need in your inner circle. Friends are trustworthy. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Verse Peter 2 and 1, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Proverbs 20, 19, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. So your friends are trustworthy. If they are talking to you about someone, they are going to talk to someone about you. You've got to keep that in your mind. Friends are your friends. They are trustworthy. They are not going to slander other people. They are not going to put other people down. They are not going to be envious. So these are the people, the people that you can put your trust in. Those are your inner, inner circle. So our lives are often chaotic, but sometimes we just have to stop. We have to be thankful. We have to pray. Um, we have to ask God for help and guidance, and we have to be present. We actually have to take time to be present with our children. Just being at a ball game does not make us present with our children. Present is actually eye contact, holding a conversation, being intentional with your time. Because often I feel horrible that I can't get to everything and oh, I'm not like this mom and oh, I can't be a part of this and I'm not going here. And then Trevor will be like, whoa, because he's my real friend. He's like, that's not being present with your children. You're present at the event, but you're not present with your children. You can spend just as much time with them at home you can interact with them there. You can eat dinner with them. You can be one-on-one. -on -one. Put your phones down. Huge, huge, huge. Put your phones down. Be intentional and be present. Next thing, if you are taking notes, you can't continue in chaos and expect a different outcome tomorrow. So nothing is me more than that. Somehow I wake up and I think, today's going to be different. Today I'm going to arrive at London Women's Care on time. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Do you know why? Because nothing changed. Nothing changed from the day before. I'm still living in my world of chaos. Get your shoes on. Get your shoes on. Do you know that you have shoes? Are they under your bed? Are they? No, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Don't you love that face morning? I don't, I don't. 
be like, you do know. You just flipping took them off yesterday. Where are they? How can you only have one shoe? Anyway, I digress. So how can we do better? How can we do better at building better relationships? So number one, take time to get to know people, just not surface conversations. So when you're talking to your spouse, I can almost name your conversations. How was your day? How was work? What are we going to eat? Kids have any homework? Sound about right? That's about it. Psh, done. And then you're like, I'm tired and I'm going to sit on the couch and watch the show. Um, or look at your phone, right? You, it's very surface. You're not taking time to figure out, hey, you had this problem the other day. Let's talk about it. How did that ever turn out? What, what went on? If you're talking to your friend, where are we going to eat? You want a coffee? Like, it's very short. Psh, 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 psh. Very surface. You're not actually saying, hey, I know that you were talking about your relationship the other day and you all were going through a rough patch. How are we doing? What do we think is going on? What can we do to make it better? So, so basically, you just have to get to know people. Don't just be on the surface. Number two. So number one, if you're taking notes, I'm going to put out beside of that intimate. So you're going to get intimate with them. You're going to know more than just their name, their job, their kids. You're going to be intimate with them. Number two is insight. Okay, you're going to take time to listen to the other person and attempt to understand their viewpoint. How many people are horrible listeners? Raise your hand. Mm, not many. A lot of y'all think you're good. Okay. I always failed listening. Shocking. I always failed listening um, in elementary school because I hated it. I hated listening. I can see the dots. You want me to connect them? Fine. I'll connect them. I hated listening. Don't need to hear it. Um, I'm kind of the same way in conversations. You, you fail to listen. So if you're with your spouse, right? You've had this argument before. You may have had it two months ago. You're like, all right, I'm ready. I know where you're going. I know what your end point's gonna be, and I'm ready to attack. Like you're already formulating. You're not hearing anything that they're saying, but you're ready for the attack. You're ready for your point to come back around, and you're not even listening to what they're trying to say. And the same thing with your friend. You are sometimes so busy doing other things that while they're talking, you're doing something else. You're texting, you're typing, you're putting on makeup in the car. You're doing other things and you're not focused on what they're trying to tell you. They may be truly hurt and you're so in your own world of things that you are not stopping to listen and truly take time to notice. Number three, introspection. This one probably hits me the hardest. Take time to evaluate your thinking and your perception of others. So sometimes I'm very bad to make superficial judgments. I see you, you're perky, you're smiling, and I'm thinking, not it. <laughs> not in the inner circle for sure. <laughs> like, I can't do it. Um, and so, but I'm proud, that's my problem. That's not her problem. That's my own issue that I have to stop and think, why do you think that way? She may be wonderful. She may have a heart of gold. That's my problem. That's my judgment that I'm making. And so I have to stop and get to know her and say, hey, maybe there's a reason. Maybe she's covering up. Maybe she's not so perky, but this is her face that she's putting out there for some hurt that she's had before. You have to stop and think, hey, why, what, what's going on? Um, the other thing is past hurts. I think a lot of times our past hurts affect how we deal with things now. Uh, basically, if you are thinking um, negatively, you're basically calling on something that happened in your past and you're bringing it forward into the current conversation. And that's something bad. That's something that you're, you're doing on your own. And sometimes I literally have to say to myself, okay, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop this way of thinking. You're being totally negative. You don't even know the whole side of the story. You've got to listen first. Next, number four, improvement. Take time for yourself and to grow personally. Take time to read, take time to pray, take time to study, take time to exercise, take a nap. Do something to help yourself rest, to help yourself grow, to help yourself become a better person. If you are not reading, if you are not praying, if you're not praying for your own family, lady, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You have to take time. Pray for your husband. Man, pray for your husband. They do a lot, they're under a lot of stress, they have a lot of things coming against them. Pray for them, pray for your children, name them by name, talk about specific things about their personalities or their character or whatever that you want to see better, that you pray for their circle of friends. That's a huge prayer. Pray that they make these good friendships and that they're not led astray. Pray for your own friends. 
You know what their problems are. You know what their issues are. Pray for it specifically. Number five, take time for others and to help them grow. And this is investment. So improvement has to come before investment, right? You have to work on yourself before you're helping out others. So one thing that Trevor has always been intentional to do at our house is to do dinner parties. So I can tell you, I would never have one. I don't think about it. I don't think about having people over. I don't mind that they're there, but I'm never gonna call you up and be like, hey, everybody come over, I'm so excited. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> but if you're there, I'm, I enjoy it. I have a good time, but it's not something that I naturally say, hey, let's do that. But he has always invested time in other people in that way. He likes to get to know people. He likes to talk. He likes to feel, hear what their struggles are. So investing in people is super important. Um, one thing, another investment that we do is making time to be with people that we have seen are good parents. So if you are our age and you have parents that are older and have older children who have turned out well, you should spend time with them. Let them invest in you. Um, we have some very great friends who we completely trust their advice. And hey, this is what we did. This is how we pushed them. This is what we did to make a difference. And we bring them in so that they can invest in us. It's not always you pouring out. Sometimes you need people to invest in you. Um, this year, I'm mentoring a girl who's in college. Now, same thing applies to her. I'm not calling her every day. I'm not texting her every day. It's not happening. But I'm there for her. If she has anything, if she needs anything, if she has a question, if she wants to talk about it, whatever, I'm gonna be there and I'm going to invest in her. So, the bottom line of our entire talk is the healthier our relationship to God is, the healthier our relationships can be with one another. So I'm gonna read you some things that the Bible says about one another. Love one another, serve one another. Bear with one another. Do not slander. Be kind, compassionate. Forgive one another. Encourage each other. Pray for each other. If you think about that, if you think about the fact that if we just do those things, our relationships would be easier. We would want more of them. We're gonna to get to know people on an intimate level, know their struggles, know their wins, know their falls. I'm gonna read them one more time. Love one another, serve one another, bear with one another, do not slander, be kind and compassionate, forgive. Forgiveness is sometimes hard, right? But they're your friend. Everybody's gonna mess up, forgive and move on. Your husband's gonna mess up, forgive and move on. Encourage each other, pray for each other. So this is the bottom line. The healthier our relationship to God, the healthier our relationships can be with one another. So what I want us to focus on in the next coming weeks, months, year, whatever, focus on your relationships. Focus on first, relationship to God. Second, relationship with others, whether it be your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, your children. Focus on those things and try to do those things, loving, serving, forgiving, not slandering, be kind, compassionate. All of those things are important. So what I want you to do right now is think of that person. Think of that relationship that you know is not where it should be, that you know is struggling, whether that be at home, whether that be with a friend that you've had forever and now you're no longer with them. Whatever that relationship is, maybe it's your child. Maybe you're having a difficult time communicating with your child or reaching out to them. Whoever that relationship is, that's what I want you to think about right now. And we're gonna have a time of prayer and I'm gonna pray. If anyone needs to pray with a counselor, they're gonna be stationed in the back, okay? But this is our time to change things. You cannot continue in chaos and expect something different in the end. So if everybody will bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much. Lord, as the song a minute ago said, we are your children. And Lord, it's sometimes so easy to forget that we are your children, that you love us, that you've made each of us as imperfect as we may be. Lord, help us to focus on our relationships. Help us to make a change, to make a difference. 
Lord, help us to be so concerned with that relationship that is out of sorts. That relationship, Lord, that one person, Lord, help us to pray right now. Help us to make a difference. Help us to be intentional, dear God. And the only way that we can do that is through your help and through your guidance. So Lord, we just ask every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, if those people that are praying for those relationships, if they need to reach out, Lord, help them to take that step. Help them to talk to someone today. Help today to be the difference, the change maker in their lives for these relationships. And it's in your precious name that we pray, Lord. And amen.